So this is the detransitioner panel. And uh, the first detransitioner I interviewed was not Helena, but Helena was like the second or third. So it's really great to be here. I don't know why I stumbled into the topic. This is not about me, but I just stumbled into this topic um, because I like stories and I like people that process their lives. And I stumbled upon this cohort of the detransitioners, and everybody has such a different experience, comes at it from a completely different way, and are all profoundly transformed by this experience. So um, I've just met some of the most amazing, resilient souls by just doing this series. And uh, so I'm very honored to be here. Um, so what we're going to do, we're just going to go through and introduce ourselves. And it's kind of laborious, but we're going to say, when, what, at what age the transition process started, and then how long since that transition has uh, desisted or, or stopped. And then we're just going to wrap. So, Jet, you want to start us up? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, I was 14 years old when I found trans on the internet. Um, I was 15 when I arrived at the clinic. I was almost 16 when I was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. I was 16 when I went on hormone blockers. I was almost 17 when I went on testosterone, and I quit testosterone when I was 22, and that was 10 months ago. Hi. Oh, um, and I had a mastectomy when I was 18. <laughs> um, I'm Michelle. Um, I transitioned in 2010 when I was 22 years old. That's when I started testosterone. I took testosterone for... Um, I stopped taking it in 2016. I took it on and off in between then. Um, I had um, a bilateral mastectomy in 2012, uh, a hysterectomy in 2018. Um, even though I'd stopped testosterone, I didn't detransition in 2016. I just kept identifying as non-binary for another four years. And I detransitioned in November 2020, when I was, sorry, when I was 32. Uh, my name is Laura Becker. Um, I started questioning gender identity when I was 15. I socially transitioned and identified as transgender when I was 18. I took testosterone when I was 19, and I had a double mastectomy when I was 20. And then I detransitioned at 22 when I was diagnosed with PTSD, and I'm now 26. So my name is Camille Kiefel. Um, so after a traumatic event, when I was 11, I started um, presenting more masculine. And then I would have been around 20 when I was introduced to gender ideology. And then 2000, um, I would have been 26 when I um, started to believe I was non-binary. I was 30 when I got a double mastectomy. Um, mm -hmm. And it was about, I was about 31, no, I would have been 32 when I detransitioned. Hello, um, I'm Richie Heron. I am, how old am I at the moment? I am <laughs> nearly 36. I've been saying I've been 35 even when I started the discourse before I turned 35. So I feel like I've been 35 for about two years now. Mm -hmm. um, but I am 35. I started my medical transition because I, I, I was a little bit mental when I was in my early 20s. I had a lot of trauma. I was dealing with a lot of different things. And I found all this stuff online and around 2013-ish. And it was very quick. And I was on um, the uh, anti-androgen called Gozerillin, which blocks testosterone in males. Um, and I started that in 2014. I would later start estrogen. And then in 2018, I had a penile version with scrotal graft, which basically means I don't have testicles anymore. And they've created a, a, a nice little pocket for us. Um, that was a bad joke, I'm sorry. Um, uh, where are we? And detransition, I went back to my name and uh, cut my hair and changed my clothes last year. I originally stopped, all because I don't have gonads that can't produce me on hormones, um, I originally stopped just estrogen for like four or five months and I was just very tired, very depressed and um, I went to the endocrinologist and I was struggling to get testosterone. And then I went on testosterone in September, hated it uh, for various different reasons. Synthetic testosterone, it's not the same as your natural bodies. It's a different hit. Um, and I had, because of the procedure I had, I was getting a lot of internal pain. 
and a lot of just discomfort. I was sleeping a lot. I just hated it. And I was like, well, if I have to pick one, I picked me poison and I picked estrogen. So am I detransitioned? I don't know if these terms are helpful anymore. I think I'm in recovery is what I am. That's me. Um, I'm Helena. Uh, I'm 24 now. I started identifying as trans when I was 15 years old, um, and I started testosterone shortly after my 18th birthday. I was on that for 17 months um, when I detransitioned at 19. So <clears throat> what is detransition? What, is that, what does that word mean, or what does that process mean yeah. for you? Uh, oh, God, I've got a lot to say about this, um, as you may know. I feel like if we buy into language and terms that were used in the inverse, we're just creating an inverse. And by authenticating and detransition, you actually authenticate and transition too. So I view it as a term of recovery from a severe um, cognitive dis oh, what's the term? Um, dissociation from yourself, from trauma and whatever. It's not the same for everyone. I know I've got to give the caveats. But for me, speaking for me, I was somebody who was very, very traumatized and found this, this idea, this thing that I could become someone else. Um, and it latched on very, very hard. And um, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought a little bit. With, with that, tr how do you... Um so if, if transition was a way to deal with trauma and then you start to detransition, then you have two traumas? Well, yeah. I mean, well, I went, when I went through on the public side, I hadn't really dealt with any of the trauma at all, like of transition. I dealt with the, the bits I thought I'd dealt with before. But what happened is I came in and I found this community that was very, very love bombing, just like the trans community. They were saying all the things in an inverse way. And I got very, very hyped up about it and was doing podcasts and interviews nonstop. And I didn't slow down for about eight months. And by about, I don't know, about October, December last year, it caught up with us and it absolutely destroyed us. And I, I was just in such a bad position for for months. And I do worry a lot about public detransitioners because they come out, they say all these talking points um, and they may or may not agree with them, but they often find that they're dealing, they put themselves, they're given so much of themselves, and I give so much of myself, and I think it was just because people were listening for the first time, and I really do, it's not that I regret obviously going in the public way, it's just that it's a really bad way to deal with your trauma from transition. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we can follow up on that, I want to broaden that. If you guys want to stay on that topic or what detransmission means to you? Um, well, going off of that idea, I think that I agree with what Richie's saying, that the language we use around transition, um, I view it as it's an attempt to change your presentation, um, cosmetic procedures. So I don't think transition is a genuine term. I think it's disingenuous. Um, I view it more as an acceptance um, coming through the cognitive dissonance into a radical acceptance of existential concerns of being itself um, and that we have to be a certain way. And there's a structure, there's a structural framework of bod embodiment that we have to accept. Um, and so it's an illusionary process. And so you're going through a paradigm shift of reality. It's more psychological and emotional than it really is physical, um, although it definitely can be physical. Um, but it's more psychological, emotional, even spiritual, um, coming to terms with reality itself, consciousness. Um, and so I, and going also of what Richie was saying about I view it as the transition is a maladaptive coping mechanism for various things, trauma, um, whatever it is. And then detransition typically can be adaptive um, because it involves acceptance. So it's an adaptive coping mechanism with reality. Um, and I also think that it's important to emphasize that being a detransitioner or whatever term you want to describe, I've been favoring 
medical trauma survivor more recently um, and just trauma survivor in general. But I think detransitioner is a neutral term. It is very charged politically with these different projections of good or evil, you know, savior or victim. I think that overall detransition can be viewed just as with transition. It can be viewed as um, either through a survivor mentality or a victim mentality. And so for me, detransition and being a detransitioner, it's part of my identity as a survivor. So it's more of a survivor mentality, a healing and growth experience, a transcendent experience. And maybe for some, typically early in their process, it'll be more of a victim mentality. And I do agree that the way the public perceives us um, is typically more of a victim based and because of that victim based um, perception of us, people then can skew it into sort of a martyrdom angle or a savior angle. Um, so those are all things to be aware of, but ultimately I do think detransition is neutral. Um, and I think the language we use around that is very important. Well, what doesn't kill us uh, makes us more sympathetic in a, in a way. Um, Eventually, should, yeah. Camille, did you have a... Oh, I guess... I guess I have a lot of thoughts on, on all of it, but I guess detransitioner as a word itself, I, I guess one of my concerns about language, like I understand language is important, but I guess too, I, I don't want to get hung up on it too much um, versus like what was actually done to me and done to others. And I think, I guess as a detransitioner, what I feel like is that I've, I feel like I've been used politically quite a bit. Um, I know like I've been flown out to, and I live in the United States. So I know that there's this huge divide politically between the right and the left and the right tends to be more religious and the left tends to, um, tends not to be, um, and it's, it's been kind of surreal. Like I know I went to a conference and, or not to a conference, I went to testify against a, a bill. And, um, and it's difficult because I'm telling my story for, to, so that they know like, okay, this is what happened and this is how it impacted me emotionally. And um, at the end, the person who had flown me out said, um, you know, this is terrible that this has happened to kids, but adults need to be able to make stupid decisions. And it just felt like a slap in the face because I'm, I'm doing this to stop this from happening to someone else. And then to be treated in such a way is, is difficult. So yeah, I definitely feel like a lot of detransitioners are being used and then we're not necessarily given the resources. Like I, we, I know that there's a lot of therapy out there, but we do need to also talk about the physical complications that detransitioners deal with and get them help for that. And that's something that I found has not happened. Um, I, I mean, someone reached out to me and then they didn't follow up because I, I still deal with complications from my, um, my top surgery, um, which was a non-binary um, double mastectomy, which is surreal that that happened and that that was allowed to happen. But yeah, it's just, there's, there's just not the physical care there for detransitioners. Michelle. Yeah. When we were talking earlier about what, um, about what does detransition mean and so on. Um, and how Laura was saying, it's sort of like a neutral term. I think it's, we've spoken a lot in the community about how it's sort of really important to have a term that, people who are still questioning might be okay adopting for themselves. So we do use language that is used by trans people and that we used before as sort of like almost like a bridge in between. And I, I, I think that's basically my thoughts on that basically, yeah. <laughs> and Jeff, Jeff, what does uh, detransition mean to you? Um, I guess it kind of agree with what Laura says that it's like just self-acceptance. Um, and that, yeah, for me, it's just mostly been self-acceptance and that um, there was nothing wrong with me. There is nothing wrong with me. 
you know, because I was very much like that as a teenager, like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? <laughs> I think a lot of um, detransitioners had that. It's like a common threat that I've seen. Um, so just like radical self-acceptance, like fully um, and getting out of that mindset of obsessing over your presentation, obsessing over how you appear to other people <laughs> and how they perceive you. I think that. Yeah. How's your trip been, Helena? Very good. You mean my, my trip here or my trip in life? The whole thing, last <laughs> like 22, 2019, so five years, six years? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That way? Yeah. Yeah, that's insane. It's been good? Yeah. Yeah. I think detransition to me was very black and white. Um, I don't have any. Uh, complicated or insightful things to say about it because it's just I was um, in a belief system that was very all-encompassing and for years I clung on to it and I did bad things to myself in the name of it and then at some point it just couldn't I couldn't hold it up anymore and it just fell off and once the scales fell from my eyes like there's no more wrestling with that question I was just like I made a massive mistake and now I need to figure this out so that's what it means to me. Your your trajectory. I think you were one of um, your star rose pretty um, pretty quick and pretty high, um, and you, you received a lot of attention for this one aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. I wondered how how that um, is that a, not another step, of another, another whole thing to process, and how you processed that, and, yeah. and and insofar as I see the wave of detransition is going to it's going to rise. Yeah, um, and so you know we can. We can be starting to to address the needs of the detransitioners right now, but actually, kind of speaking to the detransitioners from your position as having gone through this process, I'm wondering some of the advice or the insights that you've gotten about yourself and about the world through this. Um, I started speaking out when this topic was still very niche. I'm sure you remember back in like 2018 ish. Yeah, 2018, like yeah. there was like. 500 people maybe who would like or, or retweet on, on the, anything. On the Reddit, on the D-Trans subreddit. Oh, I, I'm well. thinking more on Twitter. Like there's like, I, like when I had a viral tweet, it was like 500 likes okay. or something. Um, and so I just like, that's how I was processing uh, my everything, like my, my transition, but also everything that led up to it. Um, and so I just got in the habit of, of speaking about it and, um, then recently in like the last two years, it's really exploded. And I thought that because I could handle the attention of a small community on Twitter, that I could handle um, being very public with it. And it's not to say that it's like ravaged my life or anything, but it's definitely um, not to be taken lightly at all. And it's not an appropriate way to process um, the transition or any past traumas. So I feel worried for other detransitioners who understandably are really passionate, either because like they've been harmed themselves and they like, it feels like a massive injustice. You feel like you've been lied to and taken advantage of and you just wanna speak that truth. Um, and also there's the concern for others. Like for me, a big motivation was like thinking about myself being 15 and thankfully it was before this current era where children are being pushed into it as much. Um, like it was just, my parents said no and that was it. Like there was no option for me to get these um, procedures done earlier than 18. But now like those doors are opening up more and more. So I felt a massive moral compulsion to just speak about it, speak about it, speak about it. Um, but, and I think a lot of detransitioners feel that way, but there has to be some kind of help for people to process this in a way that isn't immediately going public and isn't immediately jumping into another ideology to make sense of what you've been through, um, whether that's, I've seen some people go like very feminist or jump into like a religious belief system. And I think that there needs to be more support for people to just get in touch with what they've been feeling and what they've been through without doing it so publicly. Yeah. Can I come in on that? Yeah. Um, I think, what the first offerings I received online and on many other people were, or when I've been dealing with people who have recently went public, um, like you may have seen Seth, I, I told him, do not go public. 
Um, it was on about post noise before pictures and all this other thing. I was like, get yourself offline, ASAP. Straight away he was being asked, and I got asked this too, will you come testify? Will you come testify? Will you come testify? They don't give a shit about us. They don't care. They don't care at all. If they really cared, it would be like, you've been through a terrible thing. I'm going to start th this thing for you and do whatever. And I'm not saying that all the victims need to be like uh, handheld, but they definitely can't be taken advantage of in such a callous way. And you get journalists as well who some of them are so entitled and it's just like, uh, you're, you're lucky I'm even answering your stupid questions um, half the time. I, I think, so I'm going to collect my thoughts on the next one and I'll come back to you on that one. Yeah, a lot of things. I'm just going to add kind of to what you're saying about the testifying. Um, I, I remember testifying and um, we had another detransitioner who was also testifying. That's, they, they really wanted one detransitioner, but they couldn't got her. So they got me instead, um, which didn't feel good as well. And then they also wanted, and they told me this while I was in the room, was that they wanted this other detransitioner to, to go first because of um, his story would be more powerful. And so it's this commodification of trauma um, that happens to detransitioners. Um, and I've had a really difficult time because I want to testify to stop this from happening to others, but at the same time, I get treated like this um, often by people who fly you out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if if you guys want to keep on talking about this, we can talk about this. But I'm wondering things that I I, I lost my train of thought immediately as soon as I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was related to testifying and so on and how other people are treating us. And people evaluating your stories and putting you on a scale, or yeah, or just a freak yeah. show to some people. I think like and just yeah. like reel out the freaks. See, this oh. could happen to you, and look I, at their story. Da, 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 da. What I what was what I was thinking, what I was thinking about when you were talking was that um, I I feel like a lot of detransitioner. Well, I felt this way specifically is that um, once we get asked to do things like testify or speak to the media or so on, you kind of feel like you have to be good at it. And none of us have been trained. Like no one has any training. Well, maybe some people have training, but I don't, I don't know. None of us here, I don't think have any training. Like none of us are going through like, we're not being prepared to speak to media. We're just there as survivors speaking on trauma on television or on a podcast. And it it's, you, you sort of start feeling like I have to get better at this. And you, there's this feeling of you want to improve at being public. And I feel like that's just such, it's such a terrible direction to go in when you're trying to recover is like trying to get better at like doing public speaking when you're trying to deal with something. I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of pressure put on people to end or we put a lot of pressure on ourselves anyway to like say the right thing and make sure that we're getting the right thing across. Yeah, and I think that the, um, oh, sorry, were you going to speak? No, or? Okay. Um, I think, too, it's just like there's this focus in on um, the tragedy of what happened to us, but not how we're getting better or how we could get better. And I know um, one detransitioner, they had, um, she, she was doing all this work to improve her singing voice, and um, she had showed up on this podcast, and the podcast had purposely picked an older clip where her, or like, and the thing was that it wasn't even her full range because she now has a higher range, but they purposely um, got the clip of her in her deepest voice during that song, even though she had gotten to a higher pitch during that song. And so there's this fixation on, this is how I want to say like, they're, the media is almost presenting us as this is how we were ruined versus like this is how we re can recover and this is how far we've come. And I know she was very upset because she's like, I've done all this work to get my voice to where it is now. And they're they're not showcasing that. Yeah, there's a lot of trauma porn in it, as I would call it. Um, when I, when I went on a certain news channel, the guy goes, so Richie, you've basically ruined your life. And I was like, <laughs> thanks. Uh, oh my God. And uh, nice laden. Mm. Uh, How did you respond? 
I was just, I, I, you can see it online. I'm not sure which one it is. You'll have to find it. Um, <laughs> but you can see it in my face. I went. <laughs> I, I, fucking prick. Um, never mind. I didn't, did I say that? Oops. Um, what I want to talk about, or going back to the original question of the threads, what people are saying about like detransition and sort of recovery. Um, I'm, for context, I'm involved with a lot of other detransitioners online, offering support, getting them help that they need. Because um, a lot of people think that this can just be solved with a few therapy sessions. I'm afraid it can't. Once you've lost body parts, therapy can take you that far. Um, I think therapy is still essential for people who are in those stages before. But once you get the bit of your body, like body loss, Therapy can do very little for you. There's very little. And I think we want to self-soothe ourselves to say that we can provide the service to people who have lost body parts and it will make them better and will make us better and we're, we're, all, we're all good and we're all recovering. But the truth and reality is they're gone for good. No amount of therapy is going to bring them back. No change of hormones, no procedures. You can't recreate what you lost. You can't. And unfortunately, therapy, as I said, will only take us so far. I don't know what the solutions are. I really don't. I still feel like the burn victim who's getting asked by medics. They're like, you've just run into that fire. Like, you know, the analogy from earlier. It was like, how do I treat you? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I wish I knew. Um, I, don't, I don't think there is a st straightforward answer. Um, but we're definitely... It, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of actually, they're not completely aligned when they say like you are a little bit ruined. Your life is a little bit fucked because as, and I'm sorry for swearing, not really. Um, Alistair said earlier about the capacity to love. So for instance, um, if you take a trans person, you know, you're, and you're out of a hundred people, you lose 98 and then you've got two. Well, what happens in those two when your genitals don't work completely? What then? What, what, who, who's gonna who's gonna want to do anything with somebody who's got no interest and no desire and no functionality to have sex? My, I, I may as well just live on an island with sixty three cats, which sounds pretty awesome to be honest. But you know what I mean? It's I don't think it can be solved very easily, and there's a, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of nuance that's getting taken out. <gasps> Let's let's turn um, away from the public eye and away from the um, just momentarily from the reality of the situation. And uh, if anybody wants to say what what has helped you, like what has brought you other day transitioners peace. Okay, only only other day transitioners. Sorry. Like how? Like just through conversation, camaraderie. Yeah, trauma bonding. I suppose people like no one can really understand what it feels like unless they've done it and you can get a sense of empathy but everyone who's been like very empathetic and open-hearted I feel like it's they can't understand because you can't it's it's not something you can comprehend you know you just can't comprehend it so they're automatically default to that very sympathy view and uh, understand that and that is a very human reaction um but I think in terms of coming to terms with it and understanding and options and learning about what I can do and talking about the really like difficult things. Like who else am I going to talk about the things that are going down there unless somebody else has had it? I can't talk to women about this because that's not the same at all. You know, I can only talk to males who have had this procedure and everyone else is still learning. And I think this is another point I missed off before is I do feel like we are being trapped very much like guinea pigs in some regard of like, how should we treat you? What should we do? And we're like, well, I'm fucked. I don't know what, what to do. And it's like, they keep throwing things at us. And it sounds, I, I don't want to sound too victim -y or too entitled and stuff like that. And I think people fundamentally are just trying to help. Um, but the biggest help comes from other day transitioners. Laura, Laura, what's, what's helped you? Um, well, going off of that, mirroring, not just mirroring from other detransitioners, but just mirroring positive role models have been really important to me because a lot of my pain was, it was that I was a certain type of woman and I didn't feel that I could be loved or accepted as that type of woman, an eccentric sort of woman. 
and I didn't have role models, female role models. So mirroring from peers is um, invaluable, but also mirroring from mentors, male and female, you know, just sort of seeing, like, honestly, for me, really interacting with uh, older people has really helped me because it gives a sense of the future. Um, well, what's really helped is like long-term planning kicking in in my brain when I was 25. Um, but Just a, a one night, you're like, oh, I can see five years yeah, ahead. About 24, I was like, oh, okay, I'll make some goals lists and huh. do some stuff. Um, but yeah, having a view of the future, because again, as we've been saying, so much of the media and the journalists and such focus on the highlights of our most traumatic events. And then it is just to complain for a second. They'll ask you, so are you happy now? <laughs> like read my Twitter, um, but <laughs> you know, read my sub stacks. So, um, but besides that, you know, it's very, it kind of ends like every interview you go through all of this and it's, I mean, I find it introspective and I get enjoyment out of that personally telling the narrative, but then it ends in the present and then the future is not really discussed very often. And so thinking about the future, you know, seeing that there are, that there's potential and finding people that mirror that potential because peers can mirror that, but not as much because we're all still in the same stage. So mentors have really helped. And also therapy has really helped and therapists can be mentors, of course. Um, just having a safe older person, um, a secure attachment to an older person um, who can kind of give you that grounding in, in reality because a lot of us did not have that um, internally. And so it's important to get that um, a reflection of order within the chaos we're bringing chaos um and in a way the journalists and all of that they just escalate the chaos because it feeds their trauma porn that they want to provide with, with you know that's neutral a uh, good or bad intention whatever it's still you know discussing these evil things and escalating our chaos and our pain without doing any debriefing so to speak um or care so just having people that can be st stable and safe and calm, I'd say, like people that bring a sense of calm um, are very soothing versus people that just feed off of it. And there's so much of that and it can get so tense. Um, there's a lot of things that have helped me, but those are some of them. And this is why you're our favorite, Boise. Conversation. <laughs> Let's save me for later. Jed, what, what's some, something that's helped you? Um, well, I again, I again agree with Laura, I'd like focusing on the future, um, because when I just detransitioned, it was like my entire world was up, turned upside down because I was like 14, 15 when I got into this. And, I, you know, I went to the Dutch, so I had diagnostics and like for six months and then a diagnosis and it was really formal. So I fully believed like I have a diagnosis, you know, it's a medical thing. I have this thing. Um, and the treatment is right because I'm getting it from these clinicians who have degrees and, um, and like my entire family said it make, made sense. My environment said, said it made sense. So my reality from like age 15 onwards was that I am trans. I have gender dysphoria. I, you know, transition is the right treatment. Um, and then it never worked and I just became more depressed and like, I just didn't function for seven years and then I got out and I was really angry with myself for not functioning <laughs> because I was supposed to function because transition was supposed to fix everything. Um, and also like the whole trans revolution happened with the trans activism and, and it was really, you know, presented as something positive. And like, I, sh I felt like I should have been happy and I never wasn't and I didn't function. And then I, I blamed myself I was again like, what, what's wrong with me? Why am I not functioning? I, sh I should be happy now. I should be functioning now. Um, and then I detransitioned, and then everything was turned upside down. It was like, oh, of course I didn't function because I was medicalized. Of course I didn't function because I was told there was something wrong with me. 
of course I didn't function because I was actually a woman, like trying to pretending to be a man on like these heavy drugs. Um, so I was really distressed when I detransitioned and I immediately wanted to go to the media. I, I immediately wanted to talk to everyone because you wanted to stop. And I was treated at the Amsterdam clinic by the Dutch. So everyone wanted to talk to me because the Dutch started child transition. Um, and I kind of lost sight of myself those first couple months. Um, and, you know, at some point, like I just burnt out, like after two months, three months, I burnt out and then I went back to journalism and then I burnt out again. And then, and then I was like, okay, no more journalists. <laughs> um for now and i was kind of like i first need to work on my boundaries like that's something i would advise every detransitioner like don't talk to people before you have boundaries like learn to set your boundaries learn to say no um and like right now i'm just focusing on my own future and i and that includes speaking out but only on my terms. So something like this where I can talk and it's not through someone else. It's not a journalist. It's not, there's no filter. It's me directly. Um, and that, yeah. And, and so that's helped me. Um, and, and taking extensive breaks from journalists because they, they don't care. They really don't care. Yeah, I just want to say autonomy. Yeah. Developing autonomy and being around people who help you cultivate autonomy versus using you for a short term purpose. I, that's what you were thinking about, Jet, with um, if the authority structure around you put you in this path and then you go out of that path, that means you have to completely distrust authority. Um, so you have to find that. So, so I guess you have to build it on yourself or, or mm. figure out how to. I, I have very, I have great difficulties with trust. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Michelle, you got a glimmer in your eye. What, what you... I'm, I have been thinking things. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you just said right now, I have a hard time with trust. I, I think I wrote an entire blog that went pretty, I don't know if it went viral, but it went viral in our sphere. Um, it was the one about, uh, I was just crazy the whole time and the very end of it, I was just crazy the whole time, but at the very end of that, um, at that article, I talked at length about how, because I was crazy, quote unquote, um, and had a belief that I believe was delusional to believe that you're the opposite sex. I had a hard time trusting anyone, including myself, because I went to the doctors and they told me something. They told me that this delusional belief was correct. Um, all my friends told me it was all correct. And then when I realized it wasn't correct, they told me I'd been radicalized, which was very weird. Um, and then there's sort of that two years after it where you're like, I was so sure of this. And now I, and now I realize that I was wrong the whole time. So how do I trust myself also? Yeah. Um, that's just riffing off of that. But well, we should go back how, to... And how, how, how have you learned to trust yourself? Um, What's helped you to, to, to be... At the beginning of it, what the things that were helping me trust myself was just focusing on, I, I used the phrase material reality so many times in like the first year after I detransitioned. It's just everything has to be something objective. That's the things that I trust is something objective that I can see, that we can touch, that we can all agree is the exact same thing, um, which apparently we can't do with men and women anymore, which is very <laughs> strange. But um, yeah. So just really getting down to basics and, and mm -hmm. building building up your con conceptual framework from from just the most solid thing and then starting to move yeah on so it's basing and that's sort of where I went with with my advocacy when we talk about like having evidence based medicine it has to be on something with empirical evidence so when we're talking about gender identity there's no empirical evidence that gender identity exists so that's that was the thing I think that even made me detransition was I started focusing on it was this was part of being in social justice culture because everything's so identitarian and everything like that and I heard someone say I prioritize material reality over subjective reality 
So in order to like make a judgment about something, trust that first. And then I, I was like, that's a good idea. But wait a minute, I have a gender identity, which is a subjective reality. And over a probably a, maybe six months or something, it just slowly broke down. And I was like, yeah, then I maybe this was wrong the whole time. Then my roommate detransitioned. So everything kind of all happened at once. Yeah. Yeah. Camille or Helena, you got um, um, things that are bouncing around? So um, what helped me was, um, well, to kind of go back a little bit, um, I had done about 20 years of traditional talk therapy, including um, EMDR. I'd done dialectical behavior therapy. Um, I'd done somatic experiencing, and I had done two rounds of transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy. And that's a treatment that's, um, it's a safer cousin to ECT, and it's reserved for people who are treatment resistant like myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I was at the end of my rope when I did transition and I thought it was going to help um, because that's what it's been advertised as. And when that didn't help, um, well, what happened was that I, w days after I woke up from surgery, I ended up developing uh, multiple health issues. And at first my doctors took me seriously. And then after they thought I had psychosomatic fever, um, they stopped taking me seriously. And so what I had to do um, at that point, I was like, I need to end my life or I need to figure out something else because this isn't working. And so I decided to, I had all these health issues that are physical. I was like, I'm going to address my physical health. And so I started doing, um, I saw a bodywork practitioner who did Bowen. And I remember after the first session, I was like, okay, there's something here. Like, I feel better. Like, I'm going to keep doing this. And then I changed my diet. And then we found out later, and um, it was either my functional medicine doctor or my naturopath decided to run CRP levels. And CRP levels is a marker for inflammation in the body. And they had found I had a 7.8, and that's that's high. So um, if you're above a 3, you're, you're high. And so... Um, worked on inflammation um, and getting that down, and now I'm a one. Um, so I've made um, improvement, but I think um, that, and then I also did hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is where you receive pure oxygen in a pressurized environment. Um, and after, so before this, before I st started addressing my physical health, I had struggled with generalized anxiety disorder. I had struggled with ADHD um, I had, um, CPTSD and, um, I'd also struggled with depression. Um, I still struggle with depression now, but, um, I no longer have generalized anxiety disorder. I no longer have CPTSD. And after the HBOT, because I was a part of a case study, I went from, um, I did 60 treatments and I marked it daily when I did these treatments and I went from 72 to six on ADHD scale. So there's something here that's not being looked into for physical health and people who are, um, there are some people who are treatment resistant for depression and they have high CRP levels. So there's definitely something that needs to be looked into. And my doctors never looked into my physical health because they always dismissed my issues and thought it was always a mental one. So that's really what helped me. Um, for me, something that's been really important is kind of um, reconstructing my worldview. Because for me, uh, when I was trans identified, I was a real true believer I was like uh, that person on Twitter with the anime avatar and like the pronouns and the flags and like that I'm sure many of you yeah, have had the pleasure interacting with. Sure. That was me. Uh, not actually me, but like it would have been me. <laughs> um, and so when I, you know, I had my moment of like the scales falling from my eyes, it was like, I mean, this trans ideology, it goes so much further than just, oh, I'm going to be a boy to let not be depressed anymore. It, it gives you 
it pretends to give you answers to all of life's most existential questions. And so you feel like you know, uh, you have a conception of the world and you think uh, highly of yourself, of having a very well-developed perception of the world when you're a trans-identified teenager. And when that completely shattered, I was the, one of the most difficult things for me in recovering from that was this complete loss of understanding um, and of the ability to trust myself and the ability to trust um, what, what anyone was saying or anything that I was looking at um, or just like, am I going to make this decision today and then uh, feel like I've completely destroyed my life in four years, like committing to anything? Um, and so over these past years, I've been just uh, like intellectually uh, ravenous, like just just like exploring so many things and really trying to answer these questions that I felt like I had an answer to before. Um, and I think that's another very important journey that people need to go on. Um, but obviously in our very online world, there are other echo chambers that you can f stumble down into, especially if you're very emotionally motivated and struggling with trauma and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's that's what hmm. I feel like one of the biggest things that has helped me. Just being um, answer seeking. Yeah, yeah. And restless, uh, exhilarating and, and investigating, curious maybe is. Yeah, I would say curious okay. is a good word and um, just not like really thinking things through, not just like um, thinking that I know the answer and, and, you know, patting myself on the back for being smarter than my parents or whatever. Um, like really uh, going in and thinking things through and developing um, hmm. just a mindset of wanting to understand things properly. I would say exactly that, but I would just conceptualize it as humility mm. before being itself. N not necessarily God or any sort of spiritual, but just nature, existence, the mm -hmm. universe, hu humility of our limitations. Again, having a structure and understanding that we have to accept limitation. The boundaries are positive. Exactly. Ex yeah. So true. Yeah. Uh, lads, listen to your mom. She 100% <laughs> is right. Was always right. Um, do that. Let's hear it for the moms out there. <laughs> and a big shout out to the parents. A lot of you have really helped pull me and other detransitioners. That's, that's true, so yeah, you. that's true. Yeah. That's very true. Laura, you keep on, you make it, you make me want to just touch that, that third rail here. It's just, um, I know we're not supposed to ask this question, but just if, if you, if you use transition to to run away from your your embodied being as a sexed creature, and then you let go of that, and you return to being, you return to loving yourself, you learn to loving the world through yourself as a woman. Yeah. So, what is the content of being a woman to each of you, or, or a man? What 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 is the content? And learning to love that part of you, or to love the world through that part of you. What have you learned about yourself through that? It's a lot. Um, Exactly what you said, learning to love the world through myself in the embodiment that I have um, and the synchronicity between all things um, is crucial because the isolation and the um, microscopic viewpoint is not all the evidence that there is in reality. Um, zooming out, there's a lot more. Um, it's overwhelming. Um, but for me, really thinking about the archetype, archetypes of womanhood, um, you know, again, sort of feeling out of place. And when you're young, you don't have reference for, I, I think a lot of it is turning to, yeah, archetypal sort of um, roles that we are more, that we are more likely to succeed at you know, that there's empowerment in, as I say, leaning into the bit. I say that a lot, leaning into the bit of womanhood. You know, how can I maximize, you know, my potential? Like, what can I do here? Um, and so for me, sort of thinking about like the maiden, you know, the young woman, and then the mother figure, 
and the matriarch figure, that breaking it down to such a primal level has really helped me to understand where I can fit in in that um, and the gifts that my body can have. Um, and you said so much. Um, I think, yeah, so appreciating what there is, like gratitude, essentially. Gratitude, an abundance mindset, not to sound annoying, but an abundance mindset, like I mean it truly, you know, abundance mindset versus a scarcity mindset, you know, because, I, and I, you know, we deal all dealing with a lot of grief and there legitimately are things we've lost and that's true. And both can be true at once that there is a loss and a generativity at the same time. So for me as an artist and musician and a writer and all this, it's creating, I must create and we all must create, but generativity versus destruction. And we think and we transition because we want to generate and transform and create. So we're trying to follow our natural human impulse to create and transcend, but we're actually destroying. We're not actually creating. And through acceptance, we can actually start to create based on what's actually available to us. You know, not just the fantasy of the material reality we want or a fabricated one through surgery or, del or illusion, but actually through tangible skills that we have. So again, creativity, um, trying to link this back to whatever I was saying earlier, yeah. but yeah, creativity. M Michelle, if you... Don't mind. Um, we have a little bit more time. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, this is kind of a personal question, but it just makes me think, cause watching your Twitter feed, um, mm -hmm. how have you learned to love your body? Um, and, and has that been a big change in, in, in how you've related to the world and, and your body? Yeah. So I have had like a long body journey, which started probably about a year ago. Um, it probably started shortly after I was in Affirmation Generation. I lost 40 pounds in the last year. Um, but basically at that point in time, around that time, May or June, there was a part of me being like, I want to go back on dating apps. I want to start dating people. And then I started, I opened, I installed an app and I was going through my pictures and I was like, I hate all of these pictures of myself. So what do I do in order to love myself first before I can ask anyone else to love me? I can't even put any pictures of myself on the dating app. Um, so immediately, well, I, not immediately, but shortly after that, um, I started dieting, I well, not dieting, but just basically stopped eating terrible. So <laughs> eating normal, like a healthy person. Um, and then a couple months after that, started going to the gym. Um, and then earlier this year, started hiking. Um, and if I can bring it up, um, Grace Ladinsky Smith wrote this really great article. It's been mentioned on Gender A Wider Lens before, uh, called The Opposite of uh, Gender Dysphoria, in which she <laughs> describes taking a hike and um, with uh, her husband now, and um, at the end of it, realizing this accomplishment that my body has made, I'm celebrating how my body has brought me this far. This is the opposite of gender dysphoria. It's not gender euphoria or anything. It's loving my body for what it is. And being physical and stuff like that, I believe, is sort of what did help, starting love, to love my body. And probably about five months after, there's, there's a happy ending to this. Five months after I had all those pictures, probably in about September of last year, I was just looking through my selfies being like, I love all of these. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and and Fen, um, how have you learned to, to love yourself over, over this process? Um, well, I think for me, it's like a lot more straightforward as in that, I really believe that the medicalization caused me to become disconnected from my body because like the blockers stop my sexual development, which is a pretty major thing in puberty. Um, and testosterone um, ruined my health. <laughs> um, I had a lot of health problems and they just became worse and worse and worse. And by like four or five years, I felt like my body was falling apart and I was in pain every day. So going off of testosterone and recovering my health and feeling healthy again and having energy again and going through my own sexual development. Um, 
I just like naturally have like grown into my body over these past 10 months because my health problems all disappeared. So I feel better physically. Um, I feel better in my body because it's healthy. Um, and, you know, with the sexuality, um, that's also helped because I feel like I'm ex existing in my body. Um, and other than that, um, what I said on the other panel, like just not caring about expectations that are put on you based on your sex. Um, that. <laughs> Camille, how about you? What, what's some, some joy that you've discovered um, going out of the gender stuff? Yeah, I think that, well, one of the, the interesting things was that, um, because I, I, it's kind of like interesting because even when I was dressing more masculine, I was like really into fashion stuff. And so like I, was, I would I'd dress like in like a, a vest, like a sweater vest and a tie and stuff like that and a button down shirt and I'd be coordinating colors. And so it's kind of like nice because I think fashion has also helped me heal a little bit because it's like I can work with what I do have. And so I can accentuate, like I can, um, I can dress in a way that kind of gives the illusion of a little bit more like I haven't lost anything. And then I can be able to embrace um, my femininity through, through clothing. So that's been, that's been really helpful. And is, is has, um, how has your relationship to your femininity changed? It's, um, I fully accepted it. So that was, that was good. It was just like, I was always fighting it because that was like linked to my trauma and my past. And so once I was able to accept my femininity, it just like, it, it felt like, I was always like denying it. So then it was like this sort of like peace because it's, I made peace with it. And so now I'm okay and I've embraced it. So, yeah. Hey, Richie. Hi. What, what's some great things that have happened to you? <laughs> um, good things. I mean, I've had uh, like, although it has been quite traumatic, the last year has been really insane at the same time in a good way. Um, talking to people you would never ever cross paths with and stuff like that and um, trying to reintegrate into the world and for me because the, there has been a fundamental amount of like physical loss there that I can't kind of reconcile I have stopped fighting with myself a lot more which has enabled me to kind of integrate in society in the way that I wanted to do in transition because by the time I found transition I just didn't feel like part of society and that was supposed to bring me back in, but it didn't. Um, it just brought us further away. And for me, just that waking up to the the realities of, uh, I, I don't need to do anything to be my sex. I just need to, I'll do it now. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't need to do anything. And I don't know. It's just been easier to get involved with activities like swimming and archery and writing. I love writing and I, I love my cats and all that sort of thing. And there's a lot of things I am very grateful for too, because I'm not fighting myself. I'm not locked in me on head. So yeah. And some, some gifts that you've discovered out of the blue Helena over the last few years of wrestling with this and discovering this and getting all these internet arguments with everybody under the sun. <laughs> I feel like I've been pretty good at not getting in inter internet arguments. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? You will never see me going back and forth with someone. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I feel I really resonated with what you said, Camille. Um, I feel like I've been in the process of developing a positive vision of femininity and womanhood. Uh, I feel like our society in our um, oftentimes very justified attempt to uh, make stereotypes and rigid roles less important in people's daily lives. We've had an, an effect of really kind of flattening what it means to be a man or a woman and even kind of making some of the, in my opinion, very best things about the sexes kind of um, not like taboo to speak about. Like you can't say it's or some people would be offended by saying, um, you know, I think one of the most amazing things about womanhood is 
the ability to be a mother and give life and raise the next generation. Some people would find that reductive and offensive. Um, and so I think that one of the best things I've been able to develop is actually reconciling with um, just my being a female and the blessings that that does come with that hopefully I'll be able to experience someday and um, not be so at odds with my femininity or see my femininity as it makes me weak or it makes me less respectable in society and, and just um, be myself and not uh, overthink it so much. We're at zero. Thank you guys so much for, for opening yourself. I don't think we're doing Q&A. Are we doing Q&A? I don't think we're doing Q&A. Um, Stella's the boss. Um, round's on her, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 The drink's on me. Um, thank you all very much uh, for everything today. Uh, it's been a really lovely, felt like a, a very warm and kind of together kind of feeling, especially downstairs at, at five o'clock between, between five and seven. It's been really lovely. Um, so we'll see you here, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, for uh, my, my 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 hero Michael Biggs. I think he's here somewhere, um, who's going to be dismantling the evidence. And uh, Ken Zucker will also be here. And you know he's been decades decades working with children with gender dysphoria. And then there'll be, I think, a, a hope, an interesting debate with Malcolm Clark and uh, Michael Biggs and Ken Zucker. And I'd love if there was disagreement around whether whether children should be prescribed puberty blockers, not because I don't have any doubts. I think they're the devil's spawn, personally. <laughs> but because I like to be, you know, provoked into further thought. You know what I mean? I, I like, I, I want, I hope that many, many of our kind of presumed educated judgments do get kind of jolted a little bit over the next few days by meeting with lots of different people. Anyway, I've turned to do a sermon. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoy tonight and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.